I'm going to start off by reading one poem. And I'm going to read Coupling's poem, uh, If. Kipling. Kipling, excuse me. And this is, this is my wife Jessie's favorite poem. And I think it's a good starting point for this particular um, demonstration. And as we go through it, you'll start to understand why. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet don't look too good or walk too wise. You can dream, not make dreams your master. You can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by nabs to make a trap for fools, or watch the things give your life to broken and stoop and build them up with one out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings, Never breathe a word about your loss. If you can face your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, if you can walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men come with you, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. The first Quaker meeting I ever attended to, I was compelled to speak. And what I said was, I don't know how to pray but I felt to be moved. So it was the early 2000s and I was working with my cousin and we were building houses out on the South Shore. And it was a blast and we did a lot of things and it was fun. And if you met my cousin ever, he's... Um, Peter's Peter. <laughs> Peter's Peter, yeah, he's just a funny man. So at any rate, uh, one night after drinking and so forth, we got hungry and had an apartment up in Bridgewater. So I went uh, back and we went to go grab some food there. So at any rate, he showed me around this path and I'm saying, great, great, great. And then he's got this chair. It's beautiful. And he's like, oh yeah, this is a Mongolian chair, right? So I'm like, a Mongolian chair? He's like, yeah. And it's got all these details and it was really cool. So I go, oh, I'm going to try it out. And then he goes to me, no, 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 no. You can't sit in it. I said, what do you mean you can't sit in it? So he said, no, no, you don't, it's not made for sitting. So essentially, my cousin had made a, a piece of art, but not a functional chair. So I'd like to start from there because what that ended up doing was eventually I went home and I read a couple of books. And I had never really thought to look at chairs and how they construct them. But suddenly I was looking at chairs and thinking about all the different components and how they work. Now, um, also, just, this, just because his wife and he bought me this because they thought I should really look obnoxious. <laughs> they, uh, so that's that. <laughs> Peter, I love you. Um, so anyway, uh, to start with, when I was in high school, I had a teacher and they gave me really great advice. And it has to do with writing. And the writing will also be the same as the woodwork. And what it was was, if you don't know what to write, right? If you, you wanna start something, but just not sure where to start, just start writing something. Could be anything, it could be off topic, it could be da da da. But if you start somewhere, you're going to begin the process because once, lack of better words, once the juices start flowing, 
that's where you go. The other thing that I want to talk about that plays into this is uh, just to simplify a bridge theory, right? If you think about standing in the center of a bridge, uh, especially think about the Braga bridge, right? With the uh, uh, trusses up above, your weight isn't directly down, it gets dispersed throughout the bridge, okay? So that's a very, you know, put in those terms, I hope that's a simple concept. But the same thing is true of a chair, where the weight has to be dispersed. If all the weight comes down right here totally, it's got a weak point, right? So you wanna make sure that you separate the weight. So that's a very important thing. Now, with all that said, this is the first chair that I worked on as far as a rocking chair is concerned. And the story behind this is, I was doing, uh, we were putting together a Quaker exhibit. This is from the Friends Meeting House. And there was no seat on it. So it was just like this. And I was asked to take it down. And I said to the curator at the time, I said, I don't want to take that down. That looks awful. And she said, well, Rick, you know, this is the way the chair is. So I said, would you mind if I, you know, fasten together a seat of some sort? So she said, sure, you can do that, Rick. So that's what I did. We put a little gray padding on it to make it look old. Anyways, I ran it downstairs. I set it down. I knew it was on loan from the friend's meeting house. I'm a friend. I said, okay. I sat in it. It was so comfortable. <laughs> and I started walking in it. I'm like, this is great. And so then I looked and I said to Blair, I said, hey, I ought to buy me one of these. And Blair said, where are you going to buy one of those, Rick? And then I just simply just said to her, I'll build one. And so that's really where all this journey started as far as the rocking chairs are concerned. Uh, I, I was not a chair builder. I was a general contractor. My friend Dave Coy often talks about um, applied knowledge. So if you have enough time in certain things, you can take the knowledge that you have and apply it to new things. So you can always build upon the knowledge mm -hmm. that you have. So I went home and I started thinking about how was I going to build this. So I knew I had to make a quick template. And what I ended up doing was making a template that was made just out of paper. And uh, it wasn't really good, but it did stop. And I, I just want to read one more poem here before I go too far. And so as I'm on the process now of starting to think about how to build a rocket chair. And this is by Langston Hughes, this poem. And Langston Hughes, I was introduced to by Everett Hoagland, who I'll talk about later on. Uh, but he had given me a group of essays and some poems for him, uh, of him. So this is called Old Walt. Old Walt Whitman, when finding and seeking, finding less than sought, seeking more than found, every detail minding, of the seeking, all the finding, pleasured equally in the seeking as in the finding, each detail minding, old Walt went seeking and finding. <laughs> so that's me. I want a seeking and then a finding. So I make some really rough templates. I go home, I find some scrap wood, I take some nails, some screws, and I fashion a rocking chair. I don't have it here, but I, and the reason why is because it was really not a good rocking chair. <laughs> but just as I said about writing, it was a rocking chair. So I brought it into work and I showed everybody. My friend George back here started talking about Mel Gibson and the Patriot and how, you know, the chair collapsed every time. So no, no, you can sit in it, you can park in it. And you could, but it wasn't going to be durable. So my journey starts with something like that. And then what I ended up doing was I just took that chair and I took it apart because it wasn't worth the wood it was made out of at that point. It wasn't gonna be durable. So then I built this rocking chair. Now the seats, there's, and there's a reason for that. The reason is because I fashioned it out with this rocking chair here and this rocking chair that originally had shaker tape. 
So when I originally did this, I just hadn't really thought about the chip, about the seat yet. And when, as we go further, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this one here, I wanted to fashion it together with no, I didn't want to use any nails or any screws. So originally I cut out the tenants here and I had the legs and I had certain things set up, but then I couldn't figure out how I was going to join these together without, you know, drilling holes. But even if I drilled the holes, how could I drill them properly? And I see him in the audience back in, John Allman. And I was actually, John was helping us over at the French Green House with some of the windows. And through discussion, just as discussion with um, Everett about, you know, learn about lengths and use, we were talking about windows and then we were talking about how would you, how would you get that centered? And he showed me a centering, a dowel centering jig. So I used that and you could actually, using that too, if you do it multiple times, you can see some of the marks up here. Uh, you can actually get uh, just a straight tenon joint as well. Just cut it out with a um, wood chisel. Mm -hmm. So I was able, with some loose joint, loose joint tenery, to put this all together. So I took this into work. Um, I was pretty proud of it. As you can see, it's got its own little roll to it. Um, this was a big step forward from the first one and gave me a lot of confidence. The arms themselves, I didn't really like the shape of those arms. I don't like that look. So right when my son was moving down to Nashville, right before he moved, I actually made him hold a piece of um, just thin wood. And then I traced a curve, a couple of curves. So that way, so the arms to me is somewhat special just because. So uh, going forward, I got in this bar, it looks good or it's, it's usable. It's not totally where I want to end up. Um, but I, yeah, I am taking it out and showing it off. So I had, um, I told John about, I built a rocking chair. And at any rate, and I can't remember why, but I said, well, I'm in the back. Do you want me to bring it over? And he said, yeah, bring it over. <laughs> so I did. And I can actually remember when I showed you, John, you, you kind of like, you sort of laughed a little bit. You're like, it really is a rocking chair. <laughs> and by the way, if you've ever gone, and you know a lot of guys just do general contracting of uh, residential carpentry, sometimes they'll say, oh, I built a chair or something. And you come home, it's a big two by four mess. <laughs> so there's like nothing delicate about it. But he liked this. And at that point, um, he said, you know, if you ever need to use some tools, um, you know, you can use some of my shop. And, you know, that was, I was really grateful for that. And I did end up using um, his band saw and um, I'll talk more about that. But this one in particular, uh, I'm gonna read a quote from Emerson here. Uh, and I, I, I like this sort of um, is emblematic of this quote. There is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better or worse as, as, his, own, as his proportion. This was the best chair I could do at the time. And it was better than the first chair. And I had grown from it. And I could have looked and thought that I don't have the proper tools. I could have looked and said, you know, there's, there's a million other reasons why I can't do this. If only I had this, if only I had that. But I didn't, I just forged ahead. It took a while actually. This took me about probably six months, which seems outrageous, but that's what it took. Mm -hmm. And then as far as poetry and writing, you know, I enjoy both and I'm a dyslexic, and my, my spelling is atrocious. It's absolutely atrocious. Someone has ever gotten an email from me to see it. It's really bad. But that's the point of rewriting. You know, even when you make the mistakes, you just keep moving forward and you keep trying to get better. So this would be the second rock chair I built.
Now this is the third draw picture. So, as I had um, just completed that, my friend Jacob now had often asked if I could stop by and give him my hand with different projects in his house. See you back there, Jake. <laughs> and so I would uh, stop by and give him a hand, and you know, he'd help me move things. He'd basically have everything kind of set up, and then he'd just need me to sort of help him pull things across generally. So he would call me at random times to say, hey, Rick, can you stop by, help me out, help me out? And I did, and you know, I was always grateful, and I liked Jake quite a bit. So then at some point, he had a whole bunch of wood that he had pulled off the, um, the renovation that he was doing. So he asked if I wanted it. And it just so happens that it coincided with me building the rocking chairs. So I, I did accept. And um, this is all repurposed wood. I don't know if you can see. The, I mean, everything I stand down, but like right here is a nail mark. And I just left that there because I don't know if anyone has it ever is. heard I ever heard of the term wabi sabi, yeah. but in the perfection is perfection. So what I ended up doing was I um, the wood itself wasn't as thick as these two. So I had to modify and I had to change. So I changed with this hair, but the basic shape is all the same. My one thing was, as I was going through this, and I had sort of started with that as a copy, I hadn't really thought about the seat. So I basically had the frame, and if you can imagine that without the seat on it, just an empty space here. So I eventually, I had to figure out how I was going to get a seat on this. So I made a little template. And out of that, I was able to sketch and get the seat down on this. Now, this is not an optimal way to do it, but it was just, this was only my third set of chairs I ever built. And it was a mistake that I learned from that mistake. Because really, I should have started with the seat and worked my way off. And I'll show you with the next set how I did that. Now, with this, On the bottom here, I wrote a little um, backstory of where the wood came from, uh, how I built it. And then on this side, I put one of my poems that I wrote. And so what I'll do is I'll read that poem to you guys. And then now Jay, it's the 1831. Gideon Allen House. So let me see. So this particular poem I wrote, um, it was actually based on a true story. It was during the time of the election and um, it was on a winter night and it had started to snow. And for whatever reason, I'd gone up to the attic here and I was looking out and I could see Palmer Island, I could see the trawlers and the fishing boats riding by and so forth. And I started thinking about all the money that must have transferred to this harbor. And then I was just thinking about, you know, what it takes and what New Bedford means to the whole country and how it's sort of a symbol. And then when I got home, I turned on the radio and the snow was really falling, but my dog really wanted to go for a walk. So as the big flakes are falling and my dog is all around me and he's just sort of like jumping. I, uh, I was moved to write this just as I was sort of moved to start building rocking chairs. So the first part, right before I took my dog out for a walk is what I wrote down. So this, and this is one of my wife's favorite poems that I ever wrote. So um, that's why it's included as well. <laughs> uh, so this is called The New World Backbeat Collective. The chaotic sounds of bebop on the radio, snow falling on the city I love, the ships in the harbor, lights aglow, brace myself against the cold, but I'm feeling it, hearing the bustle and dream. America's set in rhythms of hope, disjointed and feverish. Palmer Island seems to flicker green in the wintry mist, where daisies grow in the spring. 
Waves of promotions meet in the American night. In half-lit rooms, we seek dark corners, make love, sense possibilities, out into the daylight of sweat and compromise, on American avenues paved with bricks made without straw. Vehicles travel across, a new world backbeat collected. I tap out a sink, declare it democracy, and it is democracy. The old world's collapsing castles of antiquity, ours the Renaissance Xanadu, New Bedford, my home, New Bedford, the metaphor, where St. Tubman took refuge, clutching her pistol, and Kushner flows into the ensemble. Swing and chime, America, swing and chime. So. <laughs> and like I said, that one just kind of came to me pretty quick. So going forward, so this would be my third. And like I said, it's got that elegance. I sold this to Paul Raymond, and when my son moved down to Nashville, I can't, I, I can't remember if I sent him down with it. I think when he came home, I gave it to him because at that point it was finished. But I was recently down there, and uh, it's in good shape, and I really enjoyed sitting in it, and I was reading. I just happened to be reading it. Um, so this would be... The fourth and fifth rock and chair that I've built. And this, well, we'll turn it this way for the whole crowd. So I started out with the idea of the seed. <clears throat> and um, once again, uh, I'm going to turn to my friend John in the back there and Anna, his wife. And um, he had a biscuit joint. So he opted to let me use the biscuit joiner. So I was able to join these two together. Oh, by the way, that's oak. This is red cypress and white ash. <clears throat> and the white ash actually came from Jay's house. And it wasn't part of his house. It was just an oak plank that he had. But because John had a, um, uh, a planer, we were able to plan it down and actually use it. So, so uh, we started, I started with this. And I had... I cut Daniel's hair, so this would be a four degree setting in this way. And then I took a dado blade and I was able to set it down and cut this so that way when this fits in there, you know, as you run it through on a sled, you're able to get this to fit perfectly and then this back here in the same over here. I kept the same design as far as a stretcher and a brace this way. I sort of liked. I sort of like the idea of this sitting and with the slight, you know, um, extension or compression there. So, but with this, because I have the seat, and because it's one solid piece, more or less, and this is all glued up, I didn't need the stretcher down here. And it, I even questioned myself whether I even needed this particular brace right here. Even though, you know, as you sit on this, this becomes a fulcrum. But with the rockers, it would keep it in place. So I actually have, you know, the other thing, and I haven't done it yet, but on the original that I copied, there'd be little pegs here. Dowels of pegs. And so anyways, so I, um, I may do that with this. I may not, it just depends. I did do it with the next one I'll show you which I put a finish on. So, I've moved ahead, I've gotten this far, I'm really quite happy. Uh, as I was working on this, I was discussing sort of how to do the seat. And I had seen on YouTube, someone took a dado blade and they kinda, they, they put it on the table saw and they'd run it through and they'd have to make the mark and so forth. And then John suggested that we do it on a radio arm saw, which would make a lot more sense because then I could actually see what I was doing. So that's how I was able to achieve this all being bored out here. So, you know, so you have your impression. And then um, I was, as I was working on this, they got to a point where, you know, I've got it all set, but how am I going to get this curve right here to look proper? So I was kind of thinking about just sitting in there with sandpaper for, you know, 500 years or something <laughs> crazy. And um, John bought a scoop. 
and, and he said, I have a scoop, but you know, I got one coming in the middle. I want to use it. So I was really appreciative of that, and it really made a big difference. And um, I was able to get, and we'll show you on the next one, uh, really nice lines. Well, you can probably see on this one too. So you got that. And then um, going forward, you know, I really like the bell shape. And that's just because I'm the official bellman. <laughs> now, I will say that all of this has been a learning process for me. And although, you know, the white ash is nice and it's strong, the red cedar, red cypress, is not that strong. Uh, it's a softer wood. And I ended up, you know, as I was putting this together, I didn't really even put any pressure on anything. But this cracked right here. So I wasn't really happy about that. But that's that's where I'm at. I mean, I'm not going to take the whole thing apart. I wabi sabi. Yeah. So, and the other thing I like about this particular one is make sure that everyone can see. I sort of, you know, the other ones had I would round over right here. Make sure I can put this back just slightly. But this, it almost sits right there. Well, it does sit right there. So, so it actually looks like it just comes right down. And I sort of like that look. And uh, just sort of like I like this look right here, where there's a slight um, uh, reveal. That's the word I'm looking for. So, you know, as I go forward and as I keep trying to bring it down more and more to a rocking chair that I would consider my own, I would like to keep the bell shape. And I sort of like this look right here, as far as the foot coming into the rock. And this particular rocking chair too, I almost, I feel like it's, it's almost like a, I don't know, let me see if I can't turn it to the audience here. But when I looked at it, I felt like it was almost like a gunsling. So if you can imagine in the old west, you know, they kind of lean back on the hills and they shoot each other, right? So I was sort of looking at it, it just seemed like, you know, it's got the bold legs, it's got the arms back, right? Kind of, so anyways, you gotta have fun. <laughs> So this would be my four. Yes, but it actually, I made two at a time. So I have two oaks. So this would be 005 and 006, or 006 and 005. Oh, we we'll keep rolling here. So that's the gunslinger style. And for a Quaker, nothing like being a gunslinger. <laughs> so then, I took this out and I really sanded it and got this one together. And this, this particular rocking chair, this particular one, um, because it was in red cypress and because it's a softwood, it doesn't seem like, it seems like it would be easy to work with. But in some ways, because it's more forgiving, it's actually more apt to also run you into problems. So, like, you know, you could have something as you're cutting, you know, it's just, it's doing the seed out of it was very forgiving. Getting some of these joints and then fitting them in without having them break was very unforgiving. <laughs> so that's, I think that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so once again, so I, I did this, this is not complete insofar as I would like to put on, I had seen, the name of it is the Workshop, Workshop Companion. And he, uh, on YouTube, and he's done all sorts of things, written all sorts of articles and so forth. But he suggests using tongue oil, two coats of that, and then tongue oil with a 16th, so for one cup, you use a 16th or a tablespoon or whatnot of uh, polyurethane to it, to the mix. So this is a soft wood, like I say, up here. You can really feel the grains of the wood. And I just think even though this is a tongue oil and it's oil-based, I don't think it's gonna last. I think that, you know, eventually it'll break down. So I'd like to get some sort of poly on it just to protect it for long-term. Um, after building this, this was the one that my wife chose. She said this, she liked the fact that same thing on this particular one, this one cracked and this one cracked on. So yay for me. Um, it's even. Yeah, it's even, exactly. 
So uh, anyway, she, she liked it because she likes the idea of wobby stops. But you can see here, I did put in a couple of pegs of dowels right down here. And I did put a little dowel right in here just to hold that. But if you look on the back, like I say, because this is the red cypress, when I went to put this on and this was tight, it wasn't really that tight, but it cracked right back here. So I had to sort of sand that out, glue it, keep it all together. Um, I wasn't overly excited about it, but that's that. So, no screws. No screws. No, no, I haven't used any screws and nails since the first prototype. And uh, I'm pretty proud about that. And actually, going forward, I've been thinking about it more and more. I have those uh, sort of loose joint tenery here. And what I'd like to do is make more of a mortise and tenon joint. So, on my next one, I'll start with the seat again. With this, with the stretcher and the brace here, I want to see that those are all set into this in a mortise and tenon joint, as opposed to a loose joint tenery. These up here, the same thing. Um, and then the arm itself, I'm thinking about how I can do that in a way that will also connect it into one way. I mean, I started thinking today about how I could, you know, if I wanted to do something more decorative, I could actually have it come down, shoot down like that, kind of curl in. I mean, you could do a million different things once you get rolling. The curve on the top, it seems like you did kind of a little bit of a, like a, a V curve. How did you do that? How did you make it so that it wasn't so? Oh, so. With this one here, uh, and actually, both, I think both I used, John had offered to let me use his um, bandsaw. <clears throat> but with this one here, for the middle, I had used the dado blade to take it down in the center. And then I brought it across with the bandsaw. I don't know if I'll do that again. Uh, I wasn't overly pleased with it. Um, the other thing I did too, that's a little slightly different here was so from here to here is pretty much like straight so you can kind of see the curve right there but you can see right i don't know if you'll be able to see it on this but on this one mm -hmm. i made it much more bent there but i don't like that it's not as strong and i don't actually think it's as good looking so I'm very happy with all of these chairs. I'm very happy to keep working on these chairs. I've sold one. Uh, I have a lot of interest in other people who want to buy it. Um, it is just a hobby for me. And I just keep trying to get better and better with it. Um, I also... Right. Yes. Is that also a mix of different woods, that chair? Did you talk about yep. That side? Is it yep. So this is the same as that chair. Uh, so this would be... White ash, white ash, white ash, red cypress, red cypress, red cypress. It will. Um, you know, in building this, and um, when originally asked to do this, I was kind of hoping to sort of, I don't know, maybe, maybe get someone inspired, I don't, right? And um, I hadn't expected it prior. So, long story short, I mentioned. Everett Hogan, we have some of Everett Hogan's books here in the shop uh, for sale. But he came across this article that Seth had done and that uh, um, Peter had taken some pictures of. Peter Pereira and Seth, let me see what Seth's last name. Uh, Chipwood, thank you. Uh, at any rate, he had read it and he really, really liked this article. So, I guess it was that day that this came out. He sent me a poem he had written about me building rocking chairs and poetry. So I would like, uh, and I was really tickled by this. And uh, I was really, um, I was kind of touching, you know what I mean? Like I say, I certainly wasn't expecting to inspire anybody so quickly or anything like that. You never know what people will take away from things. But he, um, but he totally, um, I think he really got the essence of the article in this poem. And I also think that he sort of got an essence for uh, what I enjoyed, sort of the journey of it. 
So what I'll do is I'll end with this particular poem, and then if there are any questions, I'll open up the floor, and then we can all go eat dinner. <laughs> so, all right, so this, he calls it Rick's Rockers. And this was by Everett Hoagland. Uh, and he wrote on the top, the Rick Finner and Poet Tavern. First, as it is with poetry, there is an unplanned plan of endeavor, purpose, out of, out of a forest of feelings, words, trees of phrase, timbering, cutting down the song, and planting, 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 crafting design that comes with curled wood shavings and writing words of carpentry and rewriting. Woodworkers and poets' ways, which by working woods, all words, own grains can make and fix an armchair upon two crescent moons and rock it back and forth in mind again and again. Two its make his heart beat, two four or four four time even, before it's finished a perfectly dynamic, sturdy poem, which you can sit these bent and rock a by baby, or your memories, daydreams, and the back and forth ways and rhythms of waves. Tides while seated on and in a comb made of wood that both contains you, moves you as you move it. One of Rick's rock is a kind of personal poem for anyone, everyone, made of wood by his mind and hand. Oh, wow. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Can I just make a comment? Sure. So that every time you put that picture on these 